Okay, welcome to our, uh, this is our third online artist talk uh, presented by the Maloof. I am Seth Pringle. I'm the program manager at the Sam and Alfreda Maloof Foundation for Arts and Crafts. Today I'm excited that we are uh, welcoming Jacqueline Bell Johnson as our uh, guest artist presenter. And if you this is your first online artist talk, you're joining with us. Uh, we are closed until further notice at our site in Alta Loma. And so we're offering these artist talks with uh, artists from our region who are featured in our gallery right now, uh, or the gallery, the exhibition that would be open right now. Uh, we have an exhibition called uh, A Thriving Artist Community, photos of artists in their homes and studios. And so uh, our first art artist talk was with Gina Loss and Egan. Our second one was with Lauren Verdugo. Uh, we're, we've lined up our, our next few artists also. Uh, so I can announce next week we'll have Conchi uh, Sanford. Uh, the week after that, we'll have Ken Johnson. After him, we'll have uh, David Amico. And then the next week, CJ Jillick. So we'll be sent, uh, creating uh, registration pages for those talks. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, just a little um, Zoom uh, functionality advice. If you're not used to using the whole Zoom meeting format, uh, in the upper right of your screen, you'll see you can choose which view you want. You'll probably want to select a uh, speaker view, not gallery view, and that will automatically focus on whoever's talking. And then down in the bottom of your menu there, you'll see chat with a little uh, speech bubble there. Um, we will, after uh, the end of the slideshow, we'll do a question and answer uh, with whatever you have typed into the chat box. So feel free to type your questions at any time during the talk. Um, and then I'll uh, get to those at the end. So. Um, uh, we'll, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, and then if you need to end the meeting in the bottom right, you should have a little, uh, or uh, leave the meeting. There's a little uh, button there too for you to exit out if you ever need to exit out. Uh, so those are probably the only buttons you'll need to use. All right, so uh, like I said, I'm excited to uh, welcome Jacqueline Bell Johnson. A little bit about her. She uh, is originally from Baltimore, Maryland. She got her BFA in jewelry and metal arts from the California College of Arts and Crafts and her master's in fine arts from Claremont Graduate University. Uh, she is currently an adjunct professor of art at Norco College in Norco and Crafton Hills College in Yucaipa, California. She's shown her work in many, many places, a few of which would be Bunny Gunner, Bunny Gunner Gallery in Claremont, uh, Cerritos College Art Gallery in Cerritos, California, Human Resources in Los Angeles, Golden West College, Huntington Beach, uh, California, the Kölner Graphic Workstatt in Cologne, Germany, UCR Arts Block in Riverside, the Torrance Art Museum in Torrance, California, Gallery Conceal Shibuya in Tokyo and Current LA, the Public Art Biennial. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Jackie. Thanks. Uh, hello, Jackie. Hi. Thank you all for coming. Um, okay. So yeah, everything he said is true. So that's good. Um, I actually live down the road from Maloof, so local is like full definition here. I am definitely a local artist. Um, I guess I'm just going to jump right into the talk. Yeah. Okay, so I have all these fancy schmancy pictures to show you. There we go. Okay. All right. Um, so craft is a really big part of what I do, what I like. Um, I really like working with my hands and exploring materials in a tactile fashion. 
Um, I also am interested in how craft connects with labor and uh, conversations about uh, labor and the value of labor, skilled and unskilled. There we go. Okay. Just trying to figure out how to get to the next picture. So um, in grad school, like the current trajectory of my work uh, really started with grad school and exper experimenting with all these things I learned in uh, making jewelry and silversmithing, all these like craft and um, skilled things and very particular like ways of handling materials. And what happens when you throw that, blow it up and kind of break a lot of the rules about things being scratched things being rusted and corroded. Um, so this is like the first piece that I did in grad school that really married both um, where I am now and um, this background in craft. So this is in steel and it's got, I, I let it uh, weather, you know, rust out in the rain. Um, when you touch it, it actually will wriggle and hum. Um, and of course, like the shadows on it. I love shadows. I love line and bringing line into my work and how it can repeat and form patterns. So uh, all those aesthetic things are also in the piece. Okay. Um, so this is one of the first uh, vagina dentata pieces that I that I've done. I have a whole, it, it's kind of a thing that um, I'll focus on every so often in sculptural form, sometimes installation, mostly in sculpture, but it's, there's so many different levels to this. Um, there is this legend of vagina dentata, and uh, it was a way to warn ancient Greek young men about loose women. That's how the story starts, but um, it has been reclaimed in a lot of different ways. You have the feminists from the 80s looking at it as a metaphor of the strength of uh, the female body and just, you know, being female. Um, it was literally translated into an anti-rape device, so vagina dentata, um, that is used in a lot of places uh, third, third world countries. It is a device that um, the user would wear, the victim, I guess you could say, and if they do fall victim, it has to be surgically removed from the perpetrator. Like, it's a pretty intense thing there. Um, but again, like, I like to bring all those ideas into the conversation, but it really is about, um, well, it starts as a meditation on form for me. So this is a uh, plexiglass and it's been uh, worked with a torch, kind of like lamp work glass. And so uh, you can see that there's these frilled edges on the plexiglass. And then I drilled a whole bunch of holes and took these bamboo skewers, which have very sharp points on them. And uh, after they were painted, I bolted them in there, glued them in. Um, so it's spiky, it's got a pink ombre going on. Um, yeah, <laughs> one of my favorites. Um, this is uh, Vitruvian Man. So if, if you're not familiar with this part of art history, uh, Leonardo da Vinci did this drawing called the Vitruvian Man, and it's the one drawing, you, see, you have seen it before, everybody has seen it. It's, the arms are out to the sides, the legs are out, and they show that Da Vinci has drawn a circle and a square over top of this new male form. Um, so Vitruvius was this ancient Greek architect and he wrote, oh, like 25, 30 volumes or so of um, different theories on architecture. So he's the first one to really kind of come up with the uniform formal aesthetic for ancient Greek architecture. And he would bring it back to um, 
the golden spiral and that the ratios of architecture had to match the ratios of man. So for instance, so many hands high determined the height of a person. So so many chunks like column pieces high determined the height of column. So it's this um, kind of a universal aesthetic that they came up with about proportion. Anyway, so I took that idea and um, I created a wooden armature of my measurements with my arms held out and my legs out. And then I used that to create a softer um, architectural space, but it's also within proportions based on my measurements. So it's kind of a reclamation, if you will. And this was taken, this photo was taken in the rain, so you can see like the reflections and stuff. And I, I dip dyed all the fabric, but that rain effect, uh, which was totally unexpected, I really liked. It, it worked with the colors and it actually kind of made more drama happen with the color in the work. So this piece was a storyteller. Um, I named it after, there's a show called The Storyteller by Jim Henson in the early 90s. And the opening sequence, there is this bird that flies through while the narrator is going. And then all of a sudden he goes into a house and turns into a man and sits on a chair. And that's the narrator. Um, I really like this. Uh, ambiguity this going back and forth and there's this connection between nature and uh, the body so I um, I started doing this piece in a different way and then I draped it over a step ladder and it just started to come out as this cloak like piece. So I hung it that way and then I just made the connection because I had just recently watched that show. And so <laughs> it's funny how like your memory kind of goes into your decision making aesthetically. Um, this is uh, this is a gallery at Claremont Graduate University and um, they made everything very 1960s white box architecture, right? It's, it's very efficient in terms of how it's built, the cost, the materials, the volume. Um, but these are cold, hard faces. They echo, they're rather brutal, I think. Um, so I was playing with the idea of taking these um, masculine forms of architecture and softening them for social efficiency. So I made this room inside the gallery space that is wax paper and uh, I just wove it together. It's definitely not the uh, best use of, of volume, right? It makes a smaller space, but um, it makes it cozy, right? And I threw a party in this space. I had uh, like a little wine and cheese gathering, um, like a picnic on the floor as a way to, to really see like, does it make this space feel different? Um, I think it does. That's a view of the outside of it. Um, there be dragons. Um, sometimes I really get stuck on titles. I really throw my hands up in the air. I'm not really sure what to call it. So this is Dragon One. There be dragons was my thesis show at CGU. Um, and this is a mix of, of everything I was exploring in those two years. There is uh, welded steel. There's dyed fabric. There's these hard lines and soft lines, the um, organic and uh, you know the geometric kind of combining. You can see some of those uh, parachute cords that are anchored into the walls there from um, the side angle. Let me see. Yeah, 
you can see uh, some of the grid like uh, structures that come out of it. Um, and again, like looking at form and how form can also be space. And I like this uh, duality that certain approaches to installation can have, right? It's an object, but it also is a space. Sorry, one too many. And there's a detail shot there. So I'm also using um, some of my jewelry uh, skills. The spine, as you can see in the detail shot there, is um, it's a jewelry chain. It's called Loop and Loop. It's one of the first ones that you learn. And um, I made that out of aluminum and the chain lengths. Uh, they graduate in, in size, but the largest one is like two feet long, so a single length, right? versus the jewelry chain that you would wear around your neck. This is another piece from uh, my thesis exhibition and uh, creating a ambiguous copper form. And these wood pieces are actually strung on a curved piece of steel rod. So they're beads. I, and um, I used, oh, I don't know, like 5,000 brads on the spine of, of those wooden pieces. And there's thread catching on all the brads and, you know, give it some color inputs. So I really look at the process is a lot of where the meaning is, where it resides in the work. So it's the act of the repetition of using that brad gun over and over and over, right? It's, it's very violent if you think about it. I'm stabbing these pieces of wood. And uh, after uh, hurting them, right, I'm connecting them back together with string. It's a, a repair almost. Um, so after grad school, I wanted to create some accountability for myself and I wanted to kind of hold on to the community of uh, colleagues that were part of my uh, graduated class. And so um, along with a few other friends, uh, I kind of co-founded the LGT group. Uh, let's get this for legit, right? LGT is short for legit and uh, proceeded to throw a bunch of art events and exhibitions, either as a curator or as like admin support, um, or, you know, as the person negotiating the real estate, because um, we had a few where we went into empty studio spaces and we signed like a, a waiver to have a show pop up for a weekend. And it was a great, a uh, chance to kind of continue the fervor that comes with grad school. Um, so this piece here is uh, your suburban palette is blocking my view. It's made out of paint cans. So in grad school and um, Seth, you probably know about this too. Uh, the, we had all these uh, paint cans donated to us and uh, there were so many like you couldn't consume them all. You couldn't use them all. Just high quality uh, house paint. But they were rejects, uh, like test paints that were turned away, right? So um, these paint can lids are all test paint that people tried and they, or they decided they didn't want to buy it. So they're returning it. Um, and I made this lantern out of it very crude, and it hangs in this apartment space uh, that my friend uh, Uni curated for LGT. And the show's called Just Ignore Me. And this piece is hanging in the middle of the room and you have to walk around it. You can't walk under it. And that's kind of the point, right? Like it's, it's blocking your view of the entire living space, this domestic space. This, the show was inside an apartment that had been emptied out because they moved. Um, so it had like another week on their lease. So they took it and used it to make an exhibition. So that's what this 
this is here. Um, I really like to use dramatic lighting in my work. Um, and often, because the work is large scale installation, it, it's only up for a few days. It's uh, only up for a little bit of time. And so for me, a lot of what I get out of it is the photograph, right? So uh, some of my decision making is about what the documentation will look like. Um, and so dramatic lighting works so well for that. Honestly, the photos do something different than, than the physical object. So I really am interested in that dichotomy as well. Um, this is probably the largest piece that I put on. This is at Human Resources in Los Angeles. And uh, Dorian Wood, who is a local musician and composer, he wrote an opera and uh, he performed it in this space. So I worked with him based on the opera and the storyline behind it to create this set, if you will. Um, for him to perform in. And the way that the, the piece is done was so that at different parts of the music, they could switch and have different views. As you can see, there's chairs kind of pushed in all over the place. There's another viewpoint from another side there. Um, the circle is where the orchestra sat. And then there was also a choir. Like it was a really, really interesting way to approach making. Um, yeah, I, I listen to music when I make. I think most artists do. But to actually like have this one um, piece of music and have your work like try to tailor it to that piece of music is a totally different approach to me. Um, yeah, so this was an amazing experience. So there's like uh, probably 10 bolts of fabric and I, I dyed everything. I created these structures. I had, had some help putting it in and, and doing some of the work on it. Um, but the, I had to use an air compressor to apply the dye just to cover the, the yardage involved with all of this. Um, and this is a piece that I did when I was in Japan. So um, as part of the butterfly effect with uh, Snezhna Petrovic and Takashi Kanamura, we, um, we all together went to Japan. They're both more or less performers. Snezhna does uh, installation and costumes in addition to um, performance. But I was like, wondering what my role in this whole thing is and how can I have that role with the cost of getting things to Japan. So I took a lot of the fabric from the uh, previous piece that I showed you and repurposed it and played with that. So I actually brought like a suitcase and a half full of, of fabric and like crocheted things like what you see here. Um, and then we were given the opportunity, we went to Ashikaga and the town hall has a traditional pimento right next door that they run and they let us install and use the space for two days and kind of set up a, a show for the local residents. Um, so I was so in love with the architecture and I wanted to play with that repetition of line. Um, so this is one of the pieces I came up with. And this is a shot of a performance piece. We met up with artists when we were there in Japan. And um, you can see some of my fabric kind of climbing on the wall on the right. And um, I was invited to uh, proposed an installation for the Industrial Cathedral, also known as the AES uh, Power Plant in Redondo Beach. This is 
with um, the uh, CA 101 show that Rodonda Beach puts on. And um, I built this artificial wave because this power plant is right next to the ocean. It's across the street and there's the beach, right? Um, so I, they have a lot of light in there, those 80s glass blocks, um, but you can't actually see the landscape. And considering how the power plant, how any power plant would um, alter the landscape, uh, impact the landscape, I felt like this is a good approach. Um, so I made an artificial wave that you can walk in and under and around um, to kind of reference like where exactly we are. Um, and uh, this is called a solution for a wall. Um, I was invited to be a part of a show at Brand Library Gallery. And um, this is around election time, so 2016, 2017. Um, I've been thinking about this for a while, like replacing the chain link in a fence and making it something more pretty. So I had been uh, weaving with um, wire and chain. There's a whole bunch of probably about 3,000 safety pins in this as well. Um, there was a brief moment, I think it lasted for a weekend on Facebook, where people were uh, promoting the use of wearing a safety pin on your lapel to indicate that you are a, um, a friend, an advocate, um, you know, a safe person to talk to if anyone is being publicly ridiculed or bullied, um, politically speaking. Anyway, so I made this with 3,000 or so safety pins and wove them all together and replaced the chain link in this fence with that. And a solution for a wall I think is um, pretty straightforward there, uh, being we're in Southern California and immigration is an issue, um, a topic here. And this is a, another vagina dentata piece. This is called Beauty is the Beast. Um, and it started with a sketch of just like, I wanted to make some kind of spiky thing that has that marquee shape to it and just went from there. Um, there is dyed wool braided and, and kind of clumped in the middle there. And, um, and again, like there's a lot of like violent construction methods of brads and drilling and, um, involved as well. This is about nine feet long, just to give you a sense of scale. Um, so when I was working on the other two pieces, this tree branch fell into my backyard from my neighbor's tree. And I was looking at it and it was just like, oh yeah, I was really excited about what, I don't know what I could do with it, but, um, I really like playing with um, weird objects like that. I, I like the idea of how you can have an object fall into your lap to work with that you can't just go to the store and buy. Um, I was pregnant at the time when I was working on this and I also have a little hatchback. So some of the engineering of, of, of all of my pieces um, goes back into the practicality of, of making it and uh, you know making it myself and uh, transporting it and you know making it functional so I can get it to places and display it. So I cut you know, this tree branch into small segments um, and that way I could carry each piece. It definitely cuts down on the weight. It made it so I could back it into my car. Um, but it also made it more flexible and adjustable in terms of the space. Um, I knew this piece was going into this space, but I wanted to make something that I could show in multiple places. Um, that's something that you don't get an opportunity to do a lot with installation 
often installations are made for a specific space and they're hard to recreate elsewhere. So um, this is me trying to figure all that out. Um, so origin of the species goes into the idea of like, we have so many different terms for, for the wood and lumber right, and trim that we buy from the hardware store. It's a huge disconnect from it being a tree, from it being, you know, a, a resource, a natural resource. And um, I just wanted to kind of create a friendly reminder of, you know, where exactly your stuff comes from. Um, so this is an installation I did at Cerritos College. They have this beautiful gallery and brand new building and they have a like display wraparound space on the outside of the gallery. So um, I proposed to take some of my fabric uh, left over from previous work and kind of re-envision it in this space. Um, this is dyed cheesecloth, and when you put a light on it, it just glows. Um, I, I don't know why, it just has this great uh, luminescent quality to it. So I brought it into the space and wove it. You can see like the pieces are woven in between each other as they're bolted to the walls. And it's just a, a burst of color. Um, this piece is called Light Wave, and um, this is in its like deactivated form, shown at San Pedro last year. I want to switch to this picture. Um, each one of those glass sconces has a microphone and a computer chip and lights set up in it. So the piece will light up based on the sound that it hears. Um, this is definitely a new direction for my work. And it's something I want to explore so much more. Um, it also is has a very steep learning curve and can be a bit on the expensive end. But um, this is a, a piece that represents so much for me. I learned how to um, CNC on this piece. I learned coding on this piece. Um, I did all the electrical wiring and soldering, all that stuff. And um, it really is a beautiful piece. There's only four shown here. That's all I could get working at the time of the photograph, which was at San Pedro last year. But I have um, about 10 of these. Um, I'm working on making a full set of 20. And I would love to have this kind of set up in a space that has really weird echoey acoustics to see it's it's a visualization of the sound and so therefore it's um a validation of the viewer right we have a lot of artwork that is about it puts a lot of pressure on the viewer to figure out what the artwork is about and uh to kind of come in with this knowledge or you have to read all these statements to understand what's going on but this is really a piece that kind of talks about just the, where is the viewer in the room? Are they audible? Um, so it really is more a reflection of, of them and their activity in the space, um, rather than just being a one-sided type of piece. Um, and then I have a piece up right now uh, that you can't see at Golden West College, they have a show up called Type. And um, I've been playing a lot with, uh, with 3D printing, with CNC, with um, computer tech, Arduino. Um, I go to a local maker space, U Makers, in, in Upland, Claremont, right on the border there. Anyway, um, so I uh, found plans for a miniature printing press and have been playing with making prints. Um, so I started making a lot of these prints. Um, the story is though, right, I've been 
collecting text on my phone for the last two or three years of uh, phrases that pop up that I see on Facebook, things that pop up in my head when I'm reading the news or reacting to something. Sometimes it's a catchy meme, right? And I have this long list of, of words and phrases and sentences um, with all that stuff captured. And I've started to make them into a collection of prints. And so I have an installation up at, at Golden West College in the type exhibition. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, but I think I'm going to take these and go further into making them into a book and kind of explore or maybe give some more context to where the phrase, where the question, where the sentence, the word came from, um, or what I'm thinking about when I wrote it down. And yeah, it's sad that this is still up in the gallery and I'm not really sure when I'll be able to even collect it. Um, Uh, in addition to the big stuff that I do, I also do a lot of little things, especially now because I am at home with two small children um, and teaching. So I don't really have, especially with all the rain that we've been getting, um, I don't really have the time to like go and work on big projects. Um, so I've been doing these small little things. These are just dip in leftover paint from my prints that I've been doing. And then if you look at them closely, there are little white and black lines marked on them. And they really are just about playing with compositions. It's kind of a like half zen in that the, the dipping the paper into leftover ink, it kind of determines what the paper is going to look like. And then I go back in and just kind of tweak it a little bit. Right? So it's a collaboration with uh, gravity, physics, right, surface tension. Um, so just to give you a little snapshot of that. And that is everything. I have to figure out how to get out of here. Okay. There we go. So that's, that's my, my presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Jackie. All right, so uh, we will enter the question and answer portion of the program. So we've got uh, some uh, questions in the chat box, some comments also. Uh, and then uh, if you have a question in mind, go ahead and type that up uh, in the chat box and we'll see if we can get to it. Uh, we have a, a comment from uh, Rob from You Maker Space uh, saying to if some of your work at the, on display at the You Maker Space in Upland. Yeah, I have some photography over there. <laughs> cool. Uh, and then let's see. So uh, Dale asks, on the large installations, do you make them in advance or just create them at the site? It's a little bit of both. Um, usually I know ahead of time, sometimes even months ahead of time. But um, the first thing I negotiate right? They're like, hey, you want to do an installation? I'm always like, yes, please. But when can I install? When does it need to display, right? When does it need to be up and running? And how long does it stay up? Um, and usually that determines a lot of, of how things go. So um, the way that I work, I have piles of sketchbooks logged with all kinds of designs and, and, and uh, plans, if you will. And then I kind of go through what, you know, works with that space, what their intention is with showing the work or the time allotted and the materials I have, right? Um, but I mostly make stuff at home with the intention of adding to it or kind of putting it together there. It's kind of like making the Legos at home and then taking the box of Legos to the place and, and building the actual piece on site. Um, I love that engineering problem though. Like, how do I get it in the car? How do I get it there? How is it going to hang from the walls? Like, um, I usually 
try, if I can, uh, to do a walkthrough ahead of time to see what the actual building looks like and go through a list of what I'm allowed to do and not allowed to do in terms of, can I put an anchor in your ceiling? Do you have ladders? You know, those kind of questions. Yeah, and I had a, a question kind of follow up from that. Um, you know, a lot of your installations have very organic kind of uh, feel to them and these, uh, you know, kind of natural forms, but they're all very highly constructed, obviously. And then they also, you know, have uh, patterns in them as well. I'm wondering what the process is like um, of trying to create forms that that look kind of, you know, more natural uh, with a process that's obviously very, you know, laborious and um, strategic. Right. Um, well, okay, so with all my artwork, there's a level of self-reliance. Um, and that goes back to all the skills I learned in Girl Scouts as a kid. And um, so weaving and uh, jewelry making, like beading, all that kind of stuff goes into play. Um, but with with all that, there's this competition. Comp oh, I can't think right now. <laughs> with all that, there's this consequence of repetition, right? So um, with all these processes, it is about repeating over and over and over again, the same action. Um, so it winds up becoming organic because all of a sudden now you have all this whole collection of the same thing. And then um, for me, it's a, I really like to try to undulate in there and that does bring more of an organic quality to it. But I think um, when, you, when you have uh, such a level of repetition, we automatically go into thinking about colonies and hives and you know, the leaves on a tree, um, unless it's organized in a very perfect way, um, it won't read geometric, right? So it automatically kind of lumps into that organic category. All right, a uh, question from Kiera. How did you go from smaller jewelry to big pieces? Um, it, it was the jump to grad school. Right, um, because when I was in undergrad doing the small jewelry stuff, um, I should say I, I tried being a jeweler and having a jewelry business and I just am not, that's not me. I can't do that. Um, so I really wanted to exercise those skills and the school that I went to, Claremont Graduate University, um, they have a lot of empty spaces. They have a lot of room. You get your own studio. Um, it really, it just allowed me to just kind of expand, right? And so the first thing I wanted to do was to get back into making jewelry because that's what I know. But I didn't want to just make jewelry. I wanted to kind of um, look at the process of it and explode it a little bit. So I started scaling it up also because um you know small silver is very expensive but like big wooden and plastic pieces are real cheap right so um you know there's there's a, a little bit of pragmatism in there as well but just having the space it, it really helped because i never had that kind of space before all right uh let's see um Question from Mary, have you always been interested in working with materials that appear uh, to flow and are light or breezy? Um, I think I can make any material look flowy and light and breezy. Um, I, I think it goes back to the necessity of things. Um, you know, when you're working on a budget, you just look for what's around that, um, is inexpensive. So rolls of wax paper. You can buy a gigantic amount of cheesecloth for not very much money. And I still am using some of the cheesecloth that I bought when I was in grad school. Right? Um, so 
there's a part of me that like whenever I get an idea, um, I kind of go through the list of every single material that I can think of that might work to get to this shape, right? And then I go through like, okay, what what can I afford to get? Or what is more realistic, you know, and is it too heavy for me to hold? Is it going to be too heavy in terms of the structure? Right. So we'll kind of start whittling, narrowing down by uh, finding the, the behavior of the material as a way to solve a lot of the engineering problems. Does that, does that answer it? Did I cover it? <laughs> All right. Uh, and uh, Ken Johnson, one of our uh, upcoming guest artists, uh, writes, uh, it appears that rather than having a driving theme behind all of your work, your interest takes on its own way through a variety of themes, points of interest, et cetera, uh, an intuitive path. Is that more or less what happens or do you have a driving interest? Aesthetics is my driving interest. Um, yeah, it, 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 it is rather uh, uh, intuition based. And um, the other part of that is again, like when I'm when I'm working with a space to do a giant installation, um, some of the ideas that I have that might appear to be part of a series or feel more thematic, um, sometimes they get pushed by the wayside because they're just not appropriate to the opportunities that I'm given. So I think um, looking at my portfolio or, you know, trying to digest it myself, um, I, I think that's a lot of, of what is happening is that it's just a matter of, you know, where the opportunities come from and, and what ideas fit that. Um, but that being said, yeah, I don't, as disciplined as I am with making, um, I don't like to stick into little, uh, corners with ideas. I really just want the piece to kind of get its own life and explode out of, um, you know, the initial thought. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I always appreciate artists who can uh, work with all different kinds of materials, work with different themes, you know, you're, you're working with fabric and then you're working with text. Uh, so, uh, you know, kind of uh, define that uh, pressure that always seems to be there to create, you know, kind of a signature style or brand, right? Do you feel that that, that pressure of, uh, you know, to make work that looks like work you've made before, you know? I don't, but I also, I'm, I'm not in like commercial gallery spaces. I'm not represented, right? Um, so, I think that might change some things, right? That might change how people approach, um, you know, this visual brand. I think it's there anyway, because um, of just what I like to do, the color choices I make, the lines on a curve, repetition. Um, yeah, and it, frankly, I'm not too worried about it. Um, I would hope that at this point, like with the type piece, the, the text piece that's at the type show, um, that's not my normal, right? And I haven't talked with many people about this collection of, of text that I've been keeping for the last few years. So, um, you know, I hope that they see my name and then are like, oh, okay, that, you know, because there is still this uh, taking up of space that's happening with that, with the way that the installation is. Um, but yeah, I. I, I kind of, I like that as a surprise when I look for other artists' work, like we did what, and oh, wow, they're taking a, a whole different path with this piece right here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, well, we should probably wrap it up here. Uh, thanks for all that. Um, any final thoughts? <laughs> Um, thank you all for coming and for listening to me talk. And um, you, you can find me on Facebook if you found this uh, event through Facebook. I'm attached to it and, you know, send me a message, say hi. 
Um, if you have any more questions for me, feel free to send them over. I will gladly talk your ear off. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for joining. And then, uh, like I mentioned, we're going to have Conchi Sanford next Friday. Uh, we'll be sending out an email blasts and social media about that. Uh, and so enjoy your weekend. All right. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you. Bye.